Please stand as you're able for the call to worship. This Lent, we are embracing questions. This Lent, we are opening ourselves to uncertainty. Despite our uncertainty, there is something we know that is unquestionably true. God loves you. And please remain standing for the hymn, which is All Glory, Loud, and Honor, found in the hymnal on page 280.
sure? All right. Somebody give me a, a key, you know, look if it's not. We're still... But friends, happy Palm Sunday. Palm branches? Yeah? I said, Hosanna, I expect you to right? you got to be paying attention during the service so that you know what it. Let's not smack our neighbor with it. But it's a great day to be together on the Palm Sunday, on the beginning of the holiest weeks in the Christian calendar. And we are preparing our hearts to look toward Jerusalem, to look Y'all, I'm getting the word. We're going to switch mics. I think it was going in and out, I think was the problem. So we are in search for an audio specialist. Anybody here who has that technique, we will talk to you. Um, But friends, this is the holiest week in the Christian calendar. It is Holy Week. This week we journey with Jesus toward the cross. Monday, Thursday is when we remember that last supper that Jesus had with his disciples. We'll gather around the table today to remember that. And then on Friday, we remember when Jesus gave his life on the cross. This week, we have a Good Friday worship service at 7 p.m. I invite you all to come to that because it truly makes Easter more meaningful when you have also experienced what happens the Friday before. Um, So I I invite you to mark your calendars for that. And of course, next Sunday is Easter Sunday. We'll have our sunrise service at 7 a.m. at Oakland Cemetery. Um, Again, friends, this is a wonderful time to greet the morning, to greet the sun, um, and to celebrate our risen Christ. And then we'll meet again here at 11 a.m. here in the sanctuary for Easter worship. It's a good week. I'm excited, and I hope you are too. And also, Hosanna... All right, just had to check. (laughs) Friends, if you are worshiping with us for the first time or the 50th time, we want to know that you are here. We have some connect cards in the pews that you can fill out and put in the offering plate. There's also a QR code on the back of the bulletin. You can just scan it with your phone and let us know that you are here that way as well. If you're worshiping with us online, you can find the connect card on the front page of our website. And so now, friends, we have a great service in store for you today, so let us continue to worship. Please stand as you're able for the gospel lesson, which is Matthew verse 21, cha- oh, chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king has come to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt the foal foal of a donkey." The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of them and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And you may be seated. We'd like to welcome all the children down front for our celebration of children. How are we doing this morning? We've already had a pretty busy morning if you were at the egg hunt. Yes, so if you were there, or if you were just listening to what's been said earlier in service, what is today? Palm 
Sunday. And so what have we been saying all day? Yeah, if you, if you had seen, that's okay, but if you were, saw us processing in all the way from the park, George, George was really leading the charge and saying Hosanna. He said it the whole way there, so good job, George. But anyway, so we have Palm Sunday, and we're saying Hosanna. Do you guys know what Hosanna means? It's been said a couple times. Yes, George. That's okay. Does that, did anyone else? Yeah, I declare. Help us. Yeah, help us and save us. That's what Hosanna means. Yes. And so for the first part of our little lesson, can I get a volunteer? George, since you were, you were so good walking down the street, come on up. All right, so I have this donkey. And do you guys know why the donkey's important for this story today? Does anyone else remember why the donkey's important? Yeah, Atticus. Yeah, Jesus rode in on a donkey. And so we're going to play pin the tail on the donkey. So we have this bigger donkey. I just want you to take this tail, and you, you can keep your eyes open. There's no spinning involved. I just want you to pin the tail on this donkey. Yeah, some tape on there. And you did. It was pretty easy, right? Yep. Can I get another volunteer? Let's do Eddie Claire, since you, since you knew the word of the day. You can go some George. All right, now, Eddie Claire, I have a much smaller donkey now, okay? And for you, I'm going to have you close your eyes and you're gonna spin around five times, and then you get to pin the tail on the donkey, okay? So here's your tail, tiny tail. Okay, close your eyes, and spin in a circle. One, two, three, four, five. And now try to pin the tail with your eyes closed. Oh man, you were you're close, not quite at the donkey. It was harder though, right? It was much harder. So when we're looking at Palm Sunday, we kind of had two donkeys going on. We had the donkey that the people that were <coughs> celebrating, the people of Jerusalem, were <coughs> saying, saying, Hosanna. <coughs> yes, they had an idea of this bigger donkey in mind. Okay, because when Jesus was coming into town, they thought Jesus was going to come in and help them with all the turmoil, they said that word in the scripture, this chaos that was happening in Jerusalem. They thought Jesus was going to come in and kind of help them out with, they had some problems with their government, and there was just some bad things going on in Jerusalem, and they thought that's what Jesus was going to help with. But Jesus actually was coming in with a different donkey in mind, a different goal. Because you guys know what is next week, what this whole week is? Easter, and what's, what's on Friday? What do we call Friday? Good Friday. You guys remember what happens on Good Friday? No. Oh. Yes. Well, that's more Easter, but on Friday, that's when Jesus sacrifices himself on the cross for all of our sins. And so when Jesus is coming in and they're yelling, Hosanna, he's going to know what is coming at the end, that he's going to sacrifice himself and save us all from our sins. So he's not just saving Jerusalem, this this easier target. He's saving the world. Good job, George. All right, so that's, that's kind of what we're talking about today. We're celebrating this beginning of Jesus saving the whole world. All right, so we're going to learn about, a little more about that upstairs. But can everyone bow their heads and pray with me? Dear God, Hosanna. Thank you for coming in to Jerusalem and for everything you do this holy week. And thank you for saving the world. Amen. Please stand as you're able for the hymn, which is Tell Me the Stories of Jesus, found in the hymnal on page 277.
happened to you, and you might have heard this story before, but a few years ago, I got a text message on my phone that was clearly meant for whoever had my number before I had gotten that phone. And I had had this number for probably six or seven years at this point, so it wasn't a recent thing. But I got this text, it was part of a group text, and it said, is Dahlia in labor? Now this is where I had an option. I had the option to politely tell them that I was not acquainted with Dahlia and that I was pretty sure that they were looking for the previous owner of my number. It could have ended right then and there. But my other option was to respond to it. So I thought about it and I typed my response. That's what I've heard. <laughs> A slew of excited texts followed. Anyone, everyone was excited for Dahlia and her upcoming bundle of joy. And I assumed, you know, that if Dahlia really was pregnant, you know, then there was an upcoming baby coming anyway. And if these were, you know, like next of kin, they wouldn't be texting a number that hadn't been their friends for seven years, right? So I figured, you know, in the long run, not causing too much turmoil. Well. Everybody was excited, but then somebody asked, does anyone know if they've picked out a name? <laughs> now, I had decided after my first text that I'd be done, that I wouldn't continue, but I mean, come on, nobody was answering. I had to do something, and I just couldn't help it, so I responded with, Methuselah. <laughs> I know, I was wrong, I just couldn't help myself. <laughs> there was a lot of silence in the text message chain after that, and finally someone typed in, what? <laughs> and then there was someone clearly in an uproar, and they said, stop, that is not Alex. Who is this? <laughs> Busted. <laughs> so I said, oh, hi, my name is Cassie. Congrats to Dahlia and her new baby. I think you are looking for whoever had this phone number before me. And that ended the conversation. They must have made a new chain, you know, without my number in it. But have you ever had the experience of not knowing who someone was? Like maybe you've been at a party with someone and somebody knows who you are and you've just like pretended the whole time that you knew who they were. And finally you go to someone else, you're like, who is that? You know, trying to get some knowledge as to who folks are. Well, this question, who is this, is the one and only question that we find in today's scripture passage for this Palm Sunday celebration. As many of you know, all throughout Lent, we have been looking carefully at the questions that have popped up all throughout our scripture passages. And we've been asking our own questions, and we've been at looking at the questions in the Bible and trying to figure out who God is and where we fit in this broad spectrum of the kingdom of God. And so this one question in our passage for today may not seem like much, but like many of the questions in this Lenten series this year, it is multi-layered. Who is this? In fact, the entire Gospel of Matthew responds to this very question trying to explain who Jesus is. From the genealogy that begins at the very beginning of the gospel to the great commission that ends it. I mean, the global church has been working on this same question for 2,000 years <clears throat> as well, trying to figure out who Jesus is. And if we've paid attention, then we know that the answer to this question, to this question of who is it, well, the answer is really not who you think, right? Let's go back a bit and see how we got to this point. So today, we celebrate a procession, Palm Sunday, remembering the procession offered to the one who came to live and to walk and to work among us. It's when the crowds gathered and laid palm branches and cloaks at the feet of Jesus. They shouted, Hosanna! There you go. That was, your, that was your one given. They shouted, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna means save us. And the people shout and sing because they have seen great things. 
And they expect great things as Jesus enters triumphantly into their holy city, into Jerusalem. Jesus, the hope of a people who long for deliverance from the powers that be, from the forces that crush them, that hold them down. Matthew says that they echo the words of the prophet Zechariah long ago as they proclaim Jesus the King, who comes in the name of the Lord, and they sing of peace in heaven, just as the angels sang peace on earth at the beginning of Jesus' life. We've come full circle. Now, one of my favorite parts of this entire episode is actually the vehicle in which Jesus entered the city on the back of a donkey with a colt by its side. But did you hear how they got the donkey? This is really my favorite part. Jesus said, go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied there and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me, and if anyone says anything to you, just say this. The Lord needs them. Now, I don't know about you, but whenever I have been in the market for a new vehicle, I've never thought about using this sort of tactic. I don't know if you have. I mean, I wonder if the salesperson would think, what they would think if I were to just point at a car and be like, the Lord needs it. <laughs> I don't think it would work as well as Jesus getting the donkey. But this was Jesus' mode of transportation for the day. This is the vehicle that would bring him triumphantly into this royal city of Jerusalem. But friends, when we ask who is this, we know that the answer is not who you think. Because this is not what people expected. What people expected was what scholars believe was happening on the, at the same time on the other side of the city. They expected the procession that accompanied the Roman emperor's representative, Pontius Pilate. You see, imagine this. There's a giant festival about to take place in Jerusalem, right? And so Pilate is also arriving to Jerusalem for the Passover feast, just like Jesus and the disciples are. But he's not there to celebrate it. Rather, he is there to keep the peace. When the crowds swell from 40,000 regular inhabitants to more than 200,000 for this high holy day. It's the same thing that happens in our country whenever, you know, a big event draws in large crowds. We have extra security come in order to help manage all of it. And so Pilate was there to keep the peace at a time when a large group of occupied people were celebrating their freedom from an oppressive power. You get it, right? That's why they need some folks there to help them with security. Because they're celebrating the exodus, when God came and freed them from the oppression they were undergoing. And so that is where all of these people are. They are living currently under the oppression of Rome. And so Pilate is traveling with troops and flags and weapons, all the signs of empire. It's very impressive. And he rides in on a magnificent war, war horse in case the flags and the weapons and the troops, you know, aren't sufficient intimidation displays of power. And he does this because of what his purpose is. He's there to show might, to instill fear, to show power. He needs this sort of display so that no one there will ask the question, who is this? They know who this is. And honestly, this is the sort of procession that folks were expecting of Jesus. I mean, all throughout the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus has been calling followers and gathering more and more disciples to his cause. All throughout the Gospel, he has done amazing things. He heals the sick. He brings sight to the blind. He feeds a multitude of people. He even walks on water. But so far, this ministry has not been one of glory and riches. It has not been about power. It has not been about might. At this point, it's rather been a ministry of behind-the-scenes acts. I mean, yeah, they've seen some amazing things, but at this point, the disciples are still trying to figure out when Jesus is going to stop walking around the countryside, stand up tall, and announce that he has come to end the Roman rule 
and to bring back the kingdom of David. This is what they long for. This is what they hope for on that day. And when Jesus enters the city, they believed that that time had come. Which is why there seems to be some confusion in our passage about what is happening here. The inhabitants are used to, high, to processions on these high holy days, but only from their oppressors. And here comes the man that they've placed all of their hopes and dreams on. But friends, we're talking about a donkey. Do you ever think about power and might coming from a donkey? Anybody here? No? And he's, I mean, Jesus is not riding on a horse, the symbol of power, but riding on a donkey or... This is another part of the passage I like. It says that he's riding on a donkey and a colt. It never actually says the colt is by his side. It says that he's riding on the donkey and the colt. So I just, in my head, kind of picture him like riding both of them at the same time. I don't know if that's just me, but that is now what you will all think of when you hear this passage. But anyway, it's exciting. It's different. Not what folks are expecting. It's a little bit strange, but they're still hopeful in this moment. So they take their cloaks, they take their palm branches, or more likely they were probably waving olive branches since they came down from the Mount of Olives. But they place them in front of Jesus as a sort of red carpet, welcoming him to the city, announcing his entrance there and shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna! in the highest heaven. You're doing a great job. But this brings us to our million dollar question for the day. Who is this? The passage says that the whole city is asking this question in turmoil. In turmoil is what the passage says. And the answer the crowd provides is, well, this is Jesus of Nazareth in Galilee. He is a prophet. And of course, this is the answer. This is Jesus of Nazareth in Galilee. This is the Son of God, our Savior, the Messiah. This is the one who has come to save us all. But, as we know, because we know the end of the story, we know what happens throughout this week. Because in just one week's time, these excited cheers of Hosanna of today will change to shouts of crucify him, crucify him. And do you know why? It's because while the simple answer to the question of who is this is, well, it's Jesus, the more complicated answer is probably not the Jesus you want right now. The Jesus they wanted was the one on the war horse ready to kick some oppressor butt. But that's not the Jesus that they got. The one they got, well, that's the Jesus who ate with sinners. The one who healed the outcast, fed the multitude, who came in riding on a donkey, and who would die a criminal's death by the state in a week's time. That is the Jesus that they got. Now, I'm sure that many of you like me, have had a fairly rough week this week, especially after the shooting that took place in Nashville on Monday. Three nine-year-olds and four adults, when you include the perpetrator, which we are called to do as Christians. Seven lives were cut short in needless and senseless violence. One of many acts of needless and senseless violence that have already taken place in 2023. If you're like me, then these events cause anger and grief. They cause us to shout out enough and how much more. Through these events, we long for someone, for anyone, to come and make things right. Honestly, this week, Friends, I would be just fine with Warhorse Jesus coming in right about now and setting this all right, using whatever force is necessary to end these terrible, senseless killings of our children. I could use that. I long for that. 
I understand the call of the crowd shouting Hosanna because they are shouting, save us. How many of us have shouted that this week in light of these shootings that happened in Nashville? We also want to yell out, save us, oh God, save us. I can understand their thirst for something better. I can understand their hopes because they are also my hopes. And I can understand their turmoil because it is also my turmoil. And so we ask, who is this? Who is this Savior? Well, this Jesus, he's much more than a war horse Savior. He's a Savior of love which is always the better way. He is consistently loving to all. Friends, he eats with sinners, he heals the outcast, he feeds the multitude, and he can save our world through us. Jesus has shown us a better way, a way that is full of love, a way that can go out into the streets and yell, Hosanna, save us, O Lord, we have had enough. It is time for us to act in the world to end these senseless acts of violence. Jesus is the one who, in our deep caverns of grief, much like many of us have been in this week, weeps with us. We get the Jesus who doesn't just tell us that sacrificing our children is wrong, but shows us this by sacrificing himself. We get a man who is followed by imperfect disciples and once blind beggars, whose entourage includes pesky children and who arrives on a donkey rather than a war horse. We get a God who created us for relationship, a God who shows that in just one week's time that death and sin and destruction do not get the last word because Jesus' resurrection mocks death itself. Hear me, friends. Jesus' heart has been broken this week, right alongside of our own. And we know that through the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus that we get to witness a better way, that we can choose and work and fight for a better way because Christ has paved that path for us. A better way for us, a better way for our world, and Lord, please, a better way for our children. And so, friends, on this Palm Sunday, as we find ourselves in grief, as we are looking for the hope of tomorrow, know that our hope is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. As we set our eyes to the end of the week, to the events that crush us, only to ultimately save us, who is this? It's Jesus. It's who it's all about. It's the one who showed us how to live so that we too could embody peace and reconciliation as an ongoing practice and stand boldly with the one who comes in the name of the Lord. The one who showed us that there is a better way and that if we would just go out and share the love of Christ with others that the world can and will be transformed. We know that answering this call will only lead us to what happens later this week. That the procession of today is serving as a funeral procession that leads to the cross. But friends, we know the rest of the story. We know that while Jesus may not have been who we thought he would be, we know that he was exactly who we needed him to be. Because we know what happens on Easter morning. And so take that love of Christ, take that humility, take that peace that passes understanding and share it with this hurt world. Because that is what Jesus was doing at the time and calls us to continue doing each and every day. Hosanna, my friends. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. Friends, we... As we go to the Lord in prayer today, as I mentioned, there is so much that has happened recently that are on our hearts and minds. The storms that we have been having have been just ravaging communities. The storms we had last week, the storms we had just yesterday, lives have been lost. 
We pray for those communities who are rebuilding, who are searching for loved ones who are grieving. We pray for the city of Nashville and for Covenant Presbyterian Church, for those families that have been impacted, both victims and perpetrators. We continue to pray for the country of Ukraine that is still undergoing a war at this time. At this time last year, we were hoping that it would be short-lived, and yet here we are a year later. And so friends, we have lots to pray about as we start this holy week. And so as we go to the Lord in prayer today, know that you are always welcome to turn in prayer requests, and I promise they will be prayed over here at the church. We will also put them in the bulletin on our prayer list if you would like. You should be able to find prayer cards in your pews that you can fill out and put in the offering plate. There's also a spot on our website you can fill out prayer requests, or if you just let me know, I'll make sure that it ends up there. And so now, friends, as we go to the Lord, I invite you to lift those specific names, those specific situations that are on your hearts and minds, and we'll respond to each petition by saying, Lord, hear our prayer. Let us pray. The Truman family. Lord, hear our prayer. The Williams family. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, hear our prayer. Wesley Tipton. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, hear our prayer. Ken Burch. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, hear our prayer. Holy, loving, and gracious God, Lord, this day we remember when you entered Jerusalem, knowing full well what waited for you at the end of the week. Lord, we stand with the crowd shouting, Hosanna, shouting, save us, O Lord. May we hear your words, may we see your ministry, may we go into the world sharing it, Lord, so that the peace that you showed that day can be shown to others. Because, Lord, we believe that this world can be transformed. We believe that through your work and through our hearts, we can make a difference. We can change hearts, we can change stances, O oh Lord. And yet, on weeks like this, we still find ourselves shouting, Save us, O Holy One. Lord, you know that our thoughts and prayers are with the families and friends of those who have experienced senseless gun violence in their lives and communities. But Lord, we also recognize that thoughts and prayers are not enough. That our prayers start here, and then they go out into the world to make change. Help us, O oh Lord, to pray with our feet, to pray with our voices, to pray with our hands. Mobilize us, O oh God. We do not want to be desensitized to violence. Stir something deep within us that empowers up us to stand up to violence of all kinds, but mostly, especially, to the violence that hurts all of God's children. Lord, give us words to speak truth to power. Show us how to use our hands, our feet, and our hearts, because we know that you require more from us in these times. Provide us with the strength only you can provide as we seek to protect all of your children. We pray for the healing of those, O oh Lord, who are in critical condition, for the parents and families who are grieving, and for our communities that have suffered a great loss. Help us to be instruments of your peace, O Lord, in a hurting world. Save us, O Lord, and help us to see what you have done for us in the power of the cross. We're grateful for all that you do and all that you continue to do, and in the ways that you continue to comfort and guide us. And Lord, we pray together the prayer 
that your son who wept with us, who grieved with us, who walked and ate with us, taught us to say together, saying, Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, one way that we respond to the hurt in the world is through our tithes and our offerings. As I invite the ushers to come forward this day, um, I want to let you know that through your giving, not only are funds going here to ministries at St. Paul, but they also get spread all through the world to those communities that are undergoing turmoil after storm, to those communities that are those communities in Ukraine that are still under war, to all of those places where God's touch is needed, where folks need to feel that peace. And so we thank you for your generosity as we continue to give to all of those all over the world. Amen.
may be seated. Friends, as we remember the night that Jesus had his last meal with his disciples, we remember that we are invited to a table that sustains us for the journey ahead of us, that sustains us for those moments of grief, those moments of peace, those moments of hope we have for what is to come. And so as we come to the table today, I invite you, my friends, to find the insert in your bulletin that says confession and forgiveness. I invite you to follow along as we first confess our sins, and then as we go to the Lord, giving thanks for all that we have been given. Because friends, when God made us, God knew what we needed to, to thrive. God made the earth creative and abundant. God gave us partners for the planting, for the harvest, for the meal. And when God gives us an orchard, we hunger for more. Please join me as we confess our sins together, but first, consider where you have gone wrong this last week. How have you harmed your relationship with God, with your neighbor, and with yourself? Take a moment and go over your week. And now, we join together on our insert and we confess our sins together. We know we have harmed each other and damaged our relationship with you. But we fear that admitting our sin will only drive us deeper into isolation. So we sneak a bite from the fruit that is not ours to take. Then we throw away the evidence of our disloyal decisions. We create distractions to hide what we have done. We point our fingers at the faults of others. We interrogate those who have no reason to lie. And we avoid you. God, you are perfect and holy, but we are imperfect and lonely. And you know we have broken trust, abandoned faith, invested in lies. You always discover the wreckage that bears our fingerprints, and our shame feels more intimate than your love. What have we done? Is it too late to receive your forgiveness? Friends, even when we sin, God does not accuse. God only asks what we have done so we can set down our guilt. And God only asks where we have gone because God wants to bring us back. Jesus died to reveal the limitless depth of God's love. You can doubt this love, but you can never change the truth of it. God knows all and forgives all. The only question that remains is whether we can accept love so freely given. We do. We embrace your mercy, and we thank you, God. Where is our God? God is here in this place. Where are your hearts? We have given them to God. What shall we do in the presence of God? We shall give our thanks and praise. Praise and thanks go to you, great God, for at the beginning of time, you wondered, you, you wondered what your spirit hovering over the water could bring forth. Sky and sea, yes. Sun and moon, yes. Land and plants and animals, people made in your divine image, the answer was yes. And you loved this answer. Everything you made was good. From the first days of humankind, when your people fell far from you in sin, you always lovingly inquired, where are you? When they were enslaved, you questioned the oppressor's true power to set your people free. When they were hungry, you sent mysterious food. They asked, what is it? And the answer was good and sustaining. 
Anytime your people were exiled and afraid, you asked the prophet if the dry bones of their self-inflicted pain could live anew. And the answer was always yes. Out of your unflinching yes for our salvation, you sent us Jesus, a savior with questionable beginnings from a dubious place. When everyday people met your son, they asked, he cannot be the Messiah, can he? When religious leaders heard Christ's teaching, they wondered, can these words come from the God that we know? Folks had their doubts, but Jesus' faith compelled them to ask, is this really the one who will save us from our sins? Christ's abundant forgiveness to sinners, humiliating death at the hands of the state, and glorious resurrection from the depth of the tomb all answered yes. And so now, humble people, we respond with our own affirmations. Is our God loving? Does our God work for the good of those who wait for justice? Does our God bring new life to those who have died? Yes, yes, yes. yes. The night before Jesus died, the people who knew him best were hungry for answers. They wondered where they should prepare the meal. They wondered what would happen next. And as Jesus spoke of an impending betrayal, each of them wrestled with a personal question. Is it me? But what Jesus did around the table that night meant that they never had to worry about those questions again. Jesus' answer was to take bread. He gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And again, after the supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks, gave it to all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood, shed for you and all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. And now when we eat this bread and drink this cup, we never have to question God's love for us. Now, we ask, O oh Lord, that you would send your spirit into this meal and into our hearts. Blend this food and drink with holiness. Fuse our searching souls with your perfect friendship, and we will become people who delight in what you have done and joyfully wonder what you shall make of us today. If you wonder whether God really wants you at this table, Jesus answers yes. Bring your unanswered questions with you, because the Spirit unquestionably beckons you to taste the truth of God's love. Friends, this day we will celebrate communion by inviting you to come down from the center aisle to take a piece of the bread and to take a cup of juice. The kneeling rails are open for a time of prayer if you are looking for that. And friends, know that this is not St. Paul's table. This is not a United Methodist table. It's Christ's table, which means it is open to everybody. Everyone is welcome to God's love in this crazy and hurting world. And so we invite you to come.
us pray. Holy, loving, and gracious God, we thank you for this holy mystery, for this gift of bread and juice that it may nourish us as we go into the world sharing your love, sharing your peace, sharing your hope. May it be the sustenance that we need in a hurting and grieving world. In your holy and precious name, amen. I'd like to turn your attention to the announcements that are in the bulletin. There is an Easter lily dedication. Um, please submit your payments to the church office. Um, you can also fill out this form, and um, it's $15 per plant. Please send that in by April the 4th. And let's see, are there any other announcements? Um, so. Let's see. Here, I have one. Okay. You'll see in your, your bulletin there should be a little piece of paper with a beautiful flower cross on it. You guys see that? It's a little piece of paper so you can take it home and put it on your refrigerator so you can remember it. All right? We invite you to bring flowers next week. Our cross out front, we are going to put flowers all over it to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. These can be flowers from your yard. These can be flowers that you found in the park, not in somebody else's yard. But flowers you found on the park, maybe on a walk. These can be flowers that you purchased at the store. But come, bring your flowers as we beautify our cross as a symbol of Christ's resurrection. And you can go put that on your fridge so you don't forget as the week goes on. All right. Don't forget about Good Friday service at 7, um, Friday night, of course, April the 7th, and Easter Sunday. Um, and at the end uh, of the service, please join us for cookies and conversation over in this area. And please stand as you're able for the hymn, which is on page, and this is important, 160, not 161, 160 in your hymnal. Rejoice ye pure in heart. <laughs> 